So good morning, you guys. Good morning, good morning, my black kings and queens. So first of all, I did not have an opportunity to meet all of you. I went on the bus with DA, but for those of you that I did not get to meet, my name is William McGee. Mrs. McGee, I'm the director of the Office of African American Student Achievement. And we've been working very tightly with Contra Costa College this school year. They've been in our district, but we really bonded with them, and I appreciate that. We saw some of you during the lunch times after various high schools when my office was there along with Contra Costa College. And so Mr. Nicholson Shanks and his team, the African American Male Leadership Collaborative, have made a commitment to really strengthen what they're doing with our district. So they're going to be coming down to the high schools a lot more frequently. As we get started up, I do want to introduce a couple of people from our district that you may not know. So first of all, we have Trustee Christian. He's one of our school board members, so if you guys give him a round of applause. So for those of you that don't know, the school board is the board that makes the decisions on how our school district runs. They create policies. So if there's ever anything that you guys don't like from the start of school time, from the lunches and breakfasts, from what's happening, you want more black classes, this is who you go and talk to. And then it's his job to help get those type of things done for the district. When there's things that you do like, tell him and the other board members so then they can do more of that. So Trustee Christian is one of the five people who makes decisions for our district. And then real quick, one of my team members, the coordinator from the Office of African American Student Achievement, Mr. John Cable. And then we have a host of advisors. And so the last thing I want to say, because I know we're about to get started up, stay connected to your black student unions. This school year, my team is planning a lot of different trips. We're going to take you, if you're connected, attending your meetings. Your grades are good, your attendance is good, your behavior is good. We're planning to go to Sacramento for a conference, Santa Cruz for a conference, but you have to be attending your black student union uh, meetings. We're eventually going to pull the entire black students from the district high school level together, so be on the lookout for that. And if you guys don't mind, please thank Contra Costa College, thank your bus drivers when you get back on the bus, give them a round of applause for having us. Thank you, guys. Thank you for that introduction, Mr. McGee. First and foremost, I want to thank you and welcome you all to Country Costa College and welcome you to the third annual African American Male Symposium. Let me take this mask off. Hopefully that's okay with everybody else so you can hear me a little bit more clearly. Um, the first thing I want to highlight before we get started, I know I learned this from Joe Frank. I want to actually give a prize to everybody who came to the front and sat in the front row today. Let's actually give a round of applause for For the ladies, I'm just trying to give you. For the ladies, I have a gift card. I believe that's a gas card and a, a Walmart card. For my fellas, I have a man book which was written by one of our guest speakers today, Jareen Gunther. We'll get from here a little bit later. Shout out to Jareen, I appreciate you for coming. But since we're already a little bit late, we're going to go ahead and jump right into things. It is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. African American male leadership wouldn't be possible without him. He actually started the program, and it was his idea to start this African American male symposium. So let's give a round of applause to Mr. John Ray. So if it's okay, I'm going to let you know, I, I took the flu shot, I swear I never do that, but I got a wife, so she basically made me do it. If you know, that's very difficult. Be besides her and the president, most people can't get me to do too many things, right, that I really don't want to do. And then I've been vaccinated, double vaccinated, and I took the shingle shot, and I had about every shot. 
So I hope it's okay, and we're six feet apart, so I hope it's okay if I take this mask off. So is it okay? Yes, yes, sir. As Mr. Shank said, I'm John Wade. I'm the founder of African American Male Leadership. All due respect to the sisters, I've been trying for a long time to get a program for the sisters, because after this, I know I'm going to get bombarded with why you're not doing this for us, and I'm going to take it, I'm going to accept it, and I'm going to resonate with it, and I'm going to do my best to get that right. So I promise I'm going to do that, okay? We're going to get that taken care of. That's going to be one of my goals before I depart West County. I want you to know, when you come to Contra Costa College, all you brothers in here, because we got brothers and sisters in here, and that's how I get out. When you come here, all them hats and hoodies, I ain't even got no hair. Believe it or not, I had some at some point. I'm going to ask you to assimilate into where you want to go, not where you at. So if you don't mind them hoodies, can you please remove your hoodies? Just take the top off. I got a daughter, I got two sons, they all got hoodies. Males, females, they got them. So I'm just going to ask you that. When you get to Contra Costa, that's one of my rules. I don't got many. And I'm going to say this to you, too. Everything I say is just food for thought. I can't even tell my own kids what to do. Knock on wood, they all came to Contra Costa. My daughter got into Northwestern, one of the best schools in the country. She came to Contra Costa. My son was at UC Davis, and he came back to come to Contra Costa College. So all due respect, the word on the street, what you hear, Contra Costa College is a great opportunity. Remember, I said food for thought, a great opportunity for you to reach all the goals you want to attain. Because everybody in here want to be successful in life. Let's just put it out there. I mean, I know you watch all the shows, you see the bling bling, you see all the things you want. You can do it. This is the best time of your life. You don't know it yet, because you know what it seems? It seems very difficult right now. School, life, friends. And it's harder being a young person than when I was a young person. It's, it's, just, it's just more difficult. More things thrown at you. Yet, I say this, take advantage of every opportunity and hear every person, because somebody might touch you, right? Just like you got brothers, sisters, grandparents, parents, cousins, uncles, and some of them do what? Some of them touch you the right way, that put something in you to get you to this stage. And I always say, you here, that's a great step in the right direction, you been here. A great step in the right direction. So I love you all. You look like me, and I love all people, I'm concerned about my people. And I'm concerned about each and every one of you. I want you to be successful. Whether you come to Contra Costa College or not, our mission is your success. Every person in this room, mission is your success. So please know that. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our president, okay, Dr. Robinson Cooper. She is a phenomenal woman unbelievable leader and all of you please know if you come to campus do your best to try to get a moment to say hello to her and let her know where you saw her because that's how she get out she will spend some time with you she will talk to you about some things that you didn't even know as president she would take the time to do so again without further ado I'm gonna ask our president to come forward and give some words of opening comments for the african-american male leadership Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and take my mask off. Is that okay? I must say that I am already glad that Mr. Wade has it on his radar to do something like this for women. I wonder. How did he know that was going to be a conversation? <laughs> well, good morning, good morning, good morning. I am so honored to be here this morning to welcome each and every one of you all to Contra Costa College. As you know, I am Dr. Tia Robinson Cooper, and I am the president of Contra Costa College. I'm honored to welcome you to this year's African American Male Leadership Symposium. When I was thinking about what to share with you today, I was checking my news feeds, not on Facebook. I wasn't on my Facebook. I, mean, I was literally on my news feeds. And an article titled, Community Colleges 
are still wasting black and Latino students' time. Out of curiosity, I began to read the article, and I was surprised by the opinion of the author, which implied that community colleges have failed on its promise to provide life-changing opportunities and a chance to transfer to four-year schools for black and Latina students. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning that Contra Costa College has not failed on that promise. Contra Costa College has not failed on the promise to provide black and Latino students with life-changing opportunities that will prepare you for not only transfer, but for career advancement and economic mobility. As I continued to set my agenda for the college, I want to let you know that I am committed to advancing equity and inclusion. I'm committed to advancing student success, economic empowerment, and social and racial justice for all students. I am reminded daily of the great work that is happening across Contra Costa College and our community. The work that is being led by the leaders that's joining us today and that's responsible for planning this event. I am here to tell you that we remain committed to our students and as you navigate your academic journey, Contra Costa College will be here with you every step of the way. I'm here to tell you that you are in the right place at the right time. Let me tell you why. Simply because you showed up today. See, I bet you thought I was about to say something real earth shattering and profound. But the reality of it is that success is simple. As long as you continue to show up, that is the biggest key for your success. As an African American, as African-American men and women, we are faced with many obstacles that can prevent, that can deter, and that can discourage us from showing up. These obstacles present themselves in many ways. Some of the ways include a lack of motivation to pursue college and a, any level of a post-secondary education. Well, today, you've overcome that obstacle by simply showing up. The lack of academic achievement and success is identified as another obstacle. And as someone, myself, who entered college underprepared, academically in both reading and math, I can personally attest to the ability to overcome that obstacle. The lack of role models and advocates well, look around the room. Can I ask the role models and advocates that are present here to please just raise your hand? Thank you. And then it's the lack of financial resources. Well, today, you are going to receive tools to guide you in overcoming that obstacle. And what about the stereotypes? And what about the perceptions? that's designed to determine your character and negatively impact your future. Well, by overcoming the earlier obstacles, you're going to be well equipped with the tools necessary to overcome that obstacle as well. This list is not exhaustive, and it does not represent all of the obstacles that African American men and women must overcome today and every day but it highlights the barriers that the research suggests prevent students of color from being successful. By showing up today, you have positioned yourself to receive the tools that's gonna to help you overcome those obstacles that you will face along your road to success. Now, as the article concluded, the author demanded accountability on behalf of all, community, of all community college students in California. How fitting 
is it that the theme of the, of the African American Male Leadership Symposium is focused on accountability. As president, it is my goal to advance student success and student completion, and in doing so, I will take full accountability for ensuring that students are successful. Now, what are you going to take accountability for? Today, you're going to have an opportunity to hear from several African-American male leaders about the importance of financial literacy, fatherhood, and developing a college-going mindset. First, financial literacy. Financial literacy is critical. And if you're wondering why it is being discussed today, let me share a few statistics with you. Research shows that over 50% of college students take out debt. And of that 50%, 27 to 40% of them default on the student loan. It also shows that 40% of adults cannot cover an emergency if it is more than $1,000 without going into debt. The research suggests that one in four families making $150,000 or more a year is still living paycheck to paycheck. And three out of 10 adults have no emergency savings. So I encourage you to pay close attention to the tools and the resources that's gonna be provided to you today to help you build financial freedom and wealth. Next, you're going to spend some time listening and dialoguing about fatherhood and the importance of family. As a single mother that raised two boys while graduating and navigating college and earning an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, three master's degrees, and a doctorate degree before my oldest child was 22, I can't stress enough how important that session is in your future success. And finally, a strong mindset about college and career readiness is necessary in accessing economic opportunities. So the mindset starts with you, but remember that Contra Costa College is your partner in your journey and your success. In closing, I want to give special thanks to Mr. John Wade, to Joel Nicholson Shanks, and George Mills for their commitment to you, which is evident by the countless hours that they've put into planning this event. I also want to give thanks to Joe Franks, Daryl Richardson, and Jereen Gunter for their participation and willingness to share their knowledge and their talents with you. Finally, I want to thank the West Contra Costa Unified School District. I want to thank the Contra Costa College Foundation and all of the faculty and staff at Contra Costa College, as well as Wells Fargo Bank and the 100 men of the Bay Area for their support and contributions. Again, welcome to Contra Costa College and have a wonderful symposium. Thank you again, Dr. Robinson Cooper. Let's give her another round of applause, please. It's a really short time. Let me go ahead and introduce our next person. I actually had the honor to meet Jareem Gunther at our first African American Male Symposium, where we were doing a, um, doing a session on black authors in the community. During that session, I had the chance to see his man book that he wrote himself. And we were so thoroughly impressed that we invited him to be part of the panel that exact day. So I was happy that he was available to come and kind of get us kicked off. So let's give a round of applause. He's a sharp brother as well. Just to put it out there. Thank you for coming. Pull my mask off too. It's always harder when you have glasses too. I know y'all might. Whoever has glasses probably knows it's always fogged up. So just so it doesn't do that, I'm gonna take them off. Uh, thank you so much for having me. 
My name is Jareem Gunter. I am actually the executive director of a high school in Richmond, uh, Summit Town High School. Um, used to work at Summit K2. There's some students here from there too. Um, so I'm really excited to be here, just to, just to be around all of you young men and young ladies. Um, this is a great opportunity. But I'll just give you a little bit about me. So about eight years ago, um, I wrote this book titled The Man Book. Um, and when I wrote it, I was like, it wasn't, it wasn't a process to me like saying, hey, I'm gonna write this book. What I did was, I said, um, I was mentoring about three young men and I took them uh, to see a motivational speaker. And we're in this hotel and we're sitting there and we're just hanging out, right? And they're playing their music and we're talking a little bit. And I said, let me look, show you about the music that we play. Let me show you the music that we listen to, right? So um, I put on Tupac, keep your hands up. Um, there's a part in the song, hold on, let me pull it up. I want, I want y'all to hear this, this little line. So, in the song, he says, I heard uh, some, some of y'all singing that. Um, but it was, it, was, it was big, so one of the students, as it's, as it's going, he stopped the song. And I said, what's up? He said, this is about my father. And he said, my dad actually lives uh, three blocks away from me, and he lives with my little brother. My little brother goes to high school with me. He said, I haven't seen my dad in five years. But every day my little brother comes to me and says, hey, dad told me to tell you hi. And he said, why won't my dad just stop and tell me how? Right? He says, I'm 18 years old now. I don't know how to tie a tie. I don't know how to speak to a young woman properly. I don't know how to shave. I don't know how to do the things that I feel like my dad should have taught me. And as a mentor, I said, what am I supposed to do with that? I had no idea, but I knew that I had to support this young brother. So I wrote this book called The Man Book. And it was just little things that I could do to support this young man. Right? I said, what can I do to help him? Um, and after I wrote it, he took to his school, and his school really enjoyed the book. Um, and about three and a half months later, the book was in 47 di different schools around uh, the United States. And I was able to travel around the country and speak to educators how to work with students of color. So I'm telling you that because we're here for a certain reason, right? We're not here um, to get the man book, which some of you might get today. Um, but we're here for one reason. We're, we're here to, to grow. Right, I want to tell you guys a quote. I want after I say this quote, I want you to say it back to me. It says, "What you are to be, you are now becoming." Somebody say it back. Say, "What you are to be, you are now becoming." So, can I get somebody to tell me what that means to them? Somebody raise their hand and tell me what they think that means. Got your hand raised, or you just wave? Oh, okay. What do you think that means? Speak up loud. Say, "Hey." I can't hear you, brother. What'd you say? I think it means you're going to achieve everything you dream. You're going to achieve everything you dream? That's good. I like that. Somebody else. What do anybody else say? What'd you say? Oh, okay. What you are to be, you are now becoming. What do you think? If you work hard enough, he said, which, if you work hard enough, you can become what you want to become. That's good. So what it means is this. What you're doing right now is what you're going to be in the future. So let me give you an example. If you show up late to school every single day, you're, you're building habits, right? So it's habits of being somebody that comes late, right? If you, if you make sure on all your grades you're doing the best you can be, that's the habits you build. So what you are to be, you're right now becoming that. Right? So every single morning, I have two kids, but with my son, we have a saying that we say every morning. We say this, and you can, so we say it, um, a part of it, uh, we, we say God, but you don't have to say God, but I want to tell you guys this, just so you guys hear this. It says, today is a good day. God has given me this day to use it as I will. I can waste it or use it for good, but what I'm here for today is important, 
because I'm exchanging a day of my life for it. I want it to be good, not bad, success, not failure, in order that I shall not regret the price God paid for it. Right? So we say that every single morning. We've been saying that since he was three years old. And the reason why that's so important is because what I'm here for today is what I'm going to become. Right? So it is important because I don't want to waste today. Today is not going to be a waste. You want to make sure while you're here today, you get every single thing you can get. Financial literacy, get that. How to do college, get that. Whatever you can do, even if you want to speak to a man that you haven't met, ever seen in your life, walk up and meet men. Ask them for their number. They can become mentors to you, become people that you can grow to become. But do not waste today, right? You can sit here and like, you know, I think in the beginning, uh, the gentleman said, hey, can everybody take their hoods off? Some people's like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. But right, but you have to understand, if, some, if a man actually do that, just do it. it. It's not hurting you, right? So what I'm saying is, today is a time to learn, to get better, to grow. Do not waste this day. Make this day the best it can be. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anybody remember the quote that he just said? I'm just curious. The first quote that he said. Say it one more time for me. What you are to be. Or what you now are, are now becoming. Let's get this man something right now. I appreciate that. So before I introduce our next guest, what I want to say is this event is about being engaging, asking questions, and networking. So anyone who asks a question, we will definitely make sure to get you a gift because we appreciate you for pushing this conversation forward. So I'm going to ask one more question. Who knows what the first presenter's topic is? I know he said in his speech, but who knows? I think this front row is killing it. That's why y'all got to sit in the front row. I'm just throwing that out there. Financial literacy. Financial literacy. And with that being said, allow me to introduce Joe Frank, who's going to be covering financial literacy. All right, all right. How you guys doing, by the way? I feel like I have a ton of stuff to say, and we got about 15 minutes, so I'm gonna do this real quick. Uh, my name is Joe Frank, financial advisor with Wells Fargo. Um, also attend Ephesians Church of God of Christ in Richmond. I see a couple of my Ephesians folks out here. Raise your hand real quick. All right, yep, yep, yep. Okay, so real quick, um, I'm 52, I've done this 28 years. So 28 years out of my could you get? Okay. You guys hear me good? Yes. So 28 years out of my 52 years, I've been doing this business. So I've been very blessed. Here's the deal. I'd like to see more of y'all doing this business. Because for every out of 100 people, there's one and a half people that look like me and you. And the rest of them, you know, so y'all remember Jackie Robinson? When I go to meetings, I feel like Jackie Robinson a lot. So uh, for the next generation, I'm not only here to give you guys financial education stuff on investing and stuff like that, but I hope to possibly see some of y'all in the business. Amen? Okay, good. So real quick, so in my business, I help people invest money. So that, uh, and, and real quick, let's give it up for your president, um, President Cooper. You know it's important when the president shows up, right? So that means y'all, all of y'all are important. So real quick, so I, in a day-to-day -day role, manage money for people. And so when I sit down with somebody like a President Cooper, I'll sit down and go through a questionnaire, really understand her needs, goals, etc. And after that questionnaire, I really would then take an opportunity to construct a portfolio. So she invests a couple hundred thousand dollars with me, and she's trying to retire in 10 or 15 years. I'm looking to grow that to a million dollars, investing in a number of different things, right? So, um, and this is part of my opener. Um, I think, you know, Joel was in one of my sessions and he actually stole my thunder, but I think I'm gonna go there anyway. So, um, one of the things I always say in my, in my classes is it pays to pay attention, right? So, my top five stocks that I invest for people 
Um, and this is my own portfolio too. There's a company called NVIDIA. Anybody play video games? Okay, so when you play video games, you have CPUs, which are central processing units, and GPUs, which are graphic processing units. So that really high-end quality that's in the Madden game is like on a GPU chip. That's made by a company called NVIDIA. Um, NVIDIA, Shopify, Amazon, Costco. One of my favorite stocks is, uh, so you guys heard the term 5G? Okay, what's 5G? Okay, good. So, when you are on a freeway and you're on your phone, it might be an iPhone, it might be a Galaxy, you're going from one American tower to the next American tower, right? So that's another one of my favorite stocks. So, everybody in the first two rows, you guys know like if you have a strong signal, you got five bars, right? If you got a weak signal, you got like one bar or no bars, right? So, all these people in the first two rows get $5 for, being, for having five bars. Because they're getting, they're close. So, whenever you're in class, I want, I want people to be upfront and engaged as, pos as much as possible. So, let me get right into it. Um, I think I've got about 10 more minutes. One of the things we want to do is, I think we have a break. Um, I'm going to say as much as I can. And then feel, would we have any time for Q&A, by the way? Later, okay. All right, so, um, how many people have bank accounts, real quick? Okay, awesome. And then how many people have jobs? Okay, that's good. Okay, so, one of the main things I really want to talk about, has everyone heard the term paying themselves first? All right, what's that? All right, okay, so I'm going to need some help, uh, Joel. All right, let me do this. So I'm just going to give Joel the bank real quick. Um, I need you to hook these, the first row up with five, and then that young man. I got you. Okay, so pay yourself first is, is what, you were, what you were talking about. So what that looks like is... Most people will make $100, but then they'll turn around and they'll spend $100. Or worse, they got a credit card, they'll try to spend $200, right? So um, one of the problems that people have, I don't care if you make $150,000 or $200,000. If you make $200,000, but you spend $201,000, you're in the same boat as somebody who just made $200 uh, in a high school job who spends $201. You guys with me? So the whole idea of pay yourself first, what you're doing is on top of anything else you pay, whether it's buying something on Amazon or whatever, you're actually saving uh, some of that money into your account. So um, what I advise people to do when you have your account, you, you've got a checking account, you've got a savings account, you want to have an account where there's money that you're going to put into that account that you're really not planning on touching. It's going to be money towards your future. It may go towards college for high school students. For college students, it may go towards their um, future home, right? So pay yourself first means that you're really just putting monies away. Whatever it is you make, you're looking to save at least 10% of that. Y'all with me? You gonna say no? Oh. All right, good. Um, this is one thing, and, and you guys are nowhere near buying a house right now, but I really want to plant this seed. Um, actually, I want y'all to do this. Who have their phones right now? Okay, Google this. And I got uh, maybe ten dollars for the first three answers. Net worth of, of, of a ho of a homeowner versus net worth of a renter. Net worth of a homeowner. Net worth of a homeowner versus net worth of a renter. All right, right here. I got it. I got it. Okay, 
255k while renters has a net worth of 6,300. All right, so stop right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to go with the system. The first 10 people give you, I'd say, 5 or 10 bucks. First 10? First 10 give 5 bucks. Okay. So stop for one second. Here's, here's what I want you guys to get. Here's what I want you guys to get. So he, he's, he's going to pass out the $5. So here's why I'm doing this. If you don't remember anything, is it pays to pay attention. It pays to pay attention. So I'm going to break you guys off $5, $10, etc. I promise you this. If you stay in school, you pay attention, you're engaged fully. Because you're going to remember more than if you don't pay attention. You pay attention, you're engaged fully. You will make so much more than any of this stuff that we're doing that encourages you to pay attention. Y'all with me? It pays to pay attention. So why I have you guys look that up, and forgive me here, there's nothing wrong with renting if you got a parent or family or member or anything, nothing wrong with that. If you have to rent, great. I want to plant that seed as an ultimate goal. So for some of the people who receive five bucks that have the answer, I already know the answer, but tell me, if you own a home, what is your net worth? Two hundred and fifty-five thousand. So your net worth is everything you own minus everything you owe, right? So if a car you own is worth forty thousand, but you owe the bank twenty thousand on a car loan, that car has a net worth of twenty thousand. So somebody that has a home has a net worth of two hundred fifty-five thousand. What is the average? Net worth of a renter. Six thousand. Let's just call it six thousand. So, real quick, for ten dollars, what's the difference between a homeowner and a renter in net worth? No, no, no. Ooh, no give me the actual answer. The difference. Yes. No, no. The actual dollar difference of net worth between. A, come on, it's quick math. Okay. If a, if a homeowner's got two fifty-five. And a renter's got six. What's the average difference between a homeowner, homeowner and a renter? 249? Who said people? 248. Okay, well, I'll go with the six, but that, that's close enough. So hook her up, hook her up. 240. Okay, so, moral of the story is there's almost $250,000 difference between a homeowner and a renter. Why is that? That's because every time you pay money into a home, it's actually going into the house. When you rent, you're paying for someone else. And again, I'm saying this not to, again, there's gonna be people who have to rent, especially when you get out of college, you're gonna to have to rent for a little bit. But I really wanna plant that seed so that everybody has that as an ultimate goal. Y'all with me? Okay, so, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit and then I'll, I'll, I'll go, go into some other things. Where, where's y'all with that? How much more time? Oh, oh perfect, perfect, okay. I didn't want to go over my time, perfect. Um, so, one of the last things I'll say, and then please write some of this stuff down because it's very, very important. So one of the biggest barriers to people owning a house is this. Normally, if you go to the bank, the bank says you have to put 20% down to buy a house. How much? 20%. Okay, so if the house is worth 700,000 for 10 bucks, how much you gotta put down? So 20% of 700 is how? Huh? 140 right here, 140 right here. Well, he said 140. This is something in the black. 140. So you got to put 140 thousand down in order to get a house. Y'all with me? We're down here now. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of people sometimes struggle to buy a house. You guys with me? Okay. Now. Um, 
And I'm not just here to pump up Wells Fargo. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be uh, an employee of Wells Fargo. Um, I've been there for about 26 of my 28 years of my career. Uh, it's not just Wells Fargo, there are other places, but one of the things that we do that I'm proud of is there are programs that have 3% down and 5% down payment programs, right? So that person's renting and says, man, I want to buy a house eventually. If their income, and, I, and I forgive me right now, I can't remember the number the exact limits, but um, the 3% down, that same person, let's say they had 700000 at 3% down, how much do they come, have to put down? Real quick. No, no, no. 3% of 700000 3%. Hey, if I, if I give you guys the answer, I'm going to pay myself. 3%. so that they can automatically save and invest so that when it comes time to whether it's 20% down or 5% down or 3% down, they have money to save and invest into that, in, into that down payment. And that's going to make a very huge difference. Not just that, beyond the investing into the house, I also help people with stocks, bonds, investments, etc. So um, what... Um, Grades we're talking about, uh, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, what, what, what? 12th grade, okay. So, a couple of things. Um, I had, uh, so what I'm going to do is, I have you guys get, I have some, yeah, okay, good. I have something called a youth top 10 list, and forgive me, I meant to have that be uh, passed out. But on that list, um, I have set short and long-term goals. One of the things I talked about was getting a part-time job in the summer that does not interfere with school, uh, funding a checking and a savings account. Uh, we talked about paying yourself, right? Okay. Um, one of the things that's very, very important, uh, you guys know about the uh, FAFSA? Okay, so that's basically completing all your financial aid, right? So. There's so many scholarships out there. So, so many scholarships out there. Um, we belong to the Hunter Black Men and Bear. We gave $110,000 out in the last scholarship, right? Um, I managed money for the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, the Kappas, a number of different groups. Uh, and they all give scholarship money away. So, you guys have it a whole lot better than I did. When I was in your area, I had to go to the library or look up bulletin board and stuff like that. Everything's, almost everything's on the phone right now. So utilize it, Google, right? Um, now that FAFSA is gonna be very key because a lot of those scholarships, if you apply for it, you do the labor and you qualify for it, you get that check. And that check, whether you bought books with it or you put a little bit of gas in your car to get back and forth to college or whatever it is, 
It's there to support you, period, point blank. Some scholarships might be tuition related. Some scholarships are just general, meaning if you qualify for it, you get it. And that supports you to go to school, right? Um, by the way, where do people plan on going to school, by the way? Just yell out some college names real quick. Any Berkeley people? Cal? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so um, how many of you guys have, and, and, and forgive me, one of the things I'll do, I know we're talking financial literacy, but whenever I do these talks, I like to make sure I engage people on just some general life skills period, so I'll give you a little bit. Five more, okay, perfect. Um, and, and I'm actually getting ready to wrap it up here. Um, so the... What I really want to leave you guys with is this. Um, engage fully, number one. Uh, one of the things I gave was homework to the college students, which I'll be talking to at 12 noon. So between now and your next goal, whether it's college, etc., make sure you have a mapped out goal, right? So it could be your financial future to buying a house, it could be going to college or whatever. Have a sense as to what you're doing in order to get here, right? So in order to get here from Wells Fargo, I hit uh, the 580 freeway, uh, yeah, 580 to Highway 80. I got off in El Portal. I drove around and forgot the, the street, but I, there's a number of steps I took to get here, right? So what you guys need to do is make sure you map that out. Um, I want to say more, but I want to wrap it up. I just want to just... There's a little story I shared with college students. I just want to share, share this with you guys. I think this, this had an impact on me. Um, <clears throat> it's called Why Eagles Fly and Chickens Flutter. So this will take two minutes and then we'll wrap it up. So once, once upon a time, long, long time ago, the eagle and the chicken were very good friends. Everywhere they went, the friends went together. It was not uncommon for people to look up and see the eagle and the chicken flying side by side through the air. One day while flying, the chicken said to the eagle, let's drop down and grab a bite to eat. My stomach is growling. Sounds good, said the eagle. So two birds glided down to the earth and saw several animals eating and decided to join them. They landed next to the cow. The cow was busy eating corn, but noticed that the eagle and chicken were sitting next to her. Welcome, said the cow. Help yourself to the corn. The two birds, uh, this took the two birds by surprise. They were not accustomed to having animals share their food quite so readily. Why are you willing to share your corn with us, asked the eagle. Well, we have plenty to eat. Mr. Farmer gives us all we want to eat, said the cow. Well, the eagle and chicken jumped in and ate their fill. When they were finished, the chicken asked more about Mr. Farmer. Well, said the cow, he grows all of our food and we don't have to work at all. You mean, said the chicken, Mr. Farmer simply gives you all you want to eat? That's right. Not only that, he gives us shelter over our heads. The chicken and eagle were shocked. They've never heard of such a thing. They've always had to search for their food and work for their shelter. When it came time to leave, the chicken and the eagle decided to discuss the situation. Hmm, maybe we should just stay here, said the chicken. We can have all the food we want without working. And that barn over there sure beats having to make a nest. Besides, I'm kind of getting tired of having to work for a living. That's a chicken, right? I don't know about all this, said the eagle. It sounds too good to be true. I find it hard to believe that one can get something for nothing. And besides, I kind of like flying high through the air and providing for food and shelter. In fact, I find it quite challenging. Well, the chicken thought it over and decided to stay where the food was free and the shelter was there. But Eagle decided he loved his freedom uh, too much to give it up and enjoyed the 
consistent challenge in making a, making a living. So after saying goodbye to his old friend the chicken, the eagle sets sail into the blue yacht. Deuces, eagle. Eagle's out, right? Eagle's gone. So everything went fine for the chicken. He ate all he wanted. He never worked. He grew fat and lazy. I'm almost done. Uh, about 10, 30 more seconds. But then one day, so the, ch the, the chicken never worked. He grew fat and lazy. But then one day, he heard the farmer and his wife said that the preacher was coming to, to visit the next day and they should have a fried chicken dinner. <laughs> Hearing that, the chicken decided it's time to check out and we joined his good friend, Mr. Eagle. But when he attempted to fly, he grew too fat and instead of being able to fly, he could only flutter. So the next day, the farmer the family and the preacher sat down to a chicken dinner. So I want to leave y'all with that. Be very diligent. I want to leave you guys with diligence. I know we're just talking about financial education and, and all that, but diligence is just excellence over time. Be excellent every day. With that, we're complete. Let's give it up one more time for Joe Frank. I'm going to ask my four panelists to come up and sit in the front. And while they're doing that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite John Wade to come down and talk about why fatherhood is one of the four pillars for African American male leadership. And then hopefully you guys get something out of this panel today. So let's give it up one more time for John Wade. Brother Franks, as usual, you are outstanding. Keep them engaged and I'll appreciate you, folks. Uh, that's my brother in the 100, and like he told me earlier, he said, the good thing about the 100 is this. It's a group that somebody calls, you pick up. If you need anything, a lawyer, a doctor, an entrepreneur, financial literacy, any kind of support. So it's great things that we doing as people. We just don't get out there, okay? Uh, fatherhood, for me, uh, this is a unique audience, and it kind of ties in why I do fatherhood. Because when I was in high school, when you look at this presentation, uh, I went to a school that, all due respect, wasn't a great school. Um, I thought we had a lot of people who came out of the school and were very successful. Uh, it was in the Bay Area, and uh, when I was in high school, my girlfriend at the time, she had a kid. And I was 16 and she was 15. And, you know, at those times, like Brother Gunther said, you don't want to be that father who your kid lives two blocks away, and I'm not condemning that because I don't know that person's situation, but you have no interaction with your seed. Because at the end of the day, I ain't stupid. Like I said, <laughs> I, I know what's going on out there. Don't look at the presentation. I was, I was a young person, okay? So, so fatherhood for me is to know your responsibility. Because unfortunately, a lot of times, not all the time, the mother, these young ladies in here, are left with the child. And then you have to do, for me, the right thing and be involved, regardless of your situation. Nothing bothers me more than someone says what the woman won't let them do. She won't let me. Come on, really? She won't let me. If you want to be engaged, you're going to get engaged. I know how this goes. Because you figured out how to get it done, so you know how to get engaged. <laughs> you, know how to, you know how to get engaged, right? So, so I want to put this on your heart. Remember I said, I don't want to tell you what to do, but I do want to give you food for thought. Because a lot of you right now don't see it. You're going to be fathers. I'm just putting it out there. You're going to be fathers, and then you want to be able to hear from men, have people pour to you the good things about fatherhood, the difficulties, and the joy. You don't want to go and see your child for the first time and look down at your child and be like, man, this is a giant responsibility, because it is. But like the man book says, figure a way to engage. So that's why I do fatherhood. 
Because for me, it's a labor of love for our people. Like I said, I love all people. I'm concerned about my people. So it's a fatherhood is a labor of love so we can build our nation. I had a president, McKinley Williams, went to Richmond High, who was 90 some percent African American. He used to always tell me, wait, it's nation building time. Nation building time. We the first people. We built this nation. They don't tell you in the history books, we built this. You know anything about slaves? They did all the work. We built this. We built the continent. So it's nation building time. We need to take care of our responsibilities. So that's why fatherhood is important for me, and that's why I want this food for thought to get to the young brothers and the young sisters so we can build our nation back where it was and where it needs to be. So thank you. Thank you, Pastor Mr. Wade. Mr. Wade first asked me to leave this time. I was excited. I was excited because I got the, a chance to invite four people that I know personally and I know that are great fathers to speak and share their experience. Um, I'm also excited because I know there's a myth that black males aren't involved in their father, uh, excuse me, their children's lives. And I wanted to get rid of that myth and also influence the next wave of black fathers. So with that being said, before we get started, just to make sure y'all paying attention, it pays to what? It pays to pay attention. Who said that? My guy right here, can you get my guy with the shirt? There it is, can you get him a shirt for him, please? And so we're gonna go ahead and introduce the panel. I'm gonna have ask you to say your name, your background, and the age of your kids. Or kid if you only have one. Does that not work? No, it's working. I'm gonna just pass it down so we go down the line. Oh, okay. How you doing? My name's Alberto Johnson. Uh, a little background. I actually graduated from Contra Costa in 2009. Uh, transferred out into Shaw University, one of the first HBCUs, HBCUs in the South. Um, my kid's name is Captain Johnson. Uh, long story short, uh, my wife is a big, you know, big baller, a uh, big leader. Uh, like I said, we'll get into some of the questions, but uh, she came up with the name. I totally agree with it. He's only two months. All right. There's a long story how he came, uh, but right now he's only two months, and he's been a joy so far. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, Y'all didn't say nothing back there, man. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, we're talking now, man. My name is Pendar Vassar Shaw, Pen for short. I'm a journalist from Oakland, California, and my daughter is Zuri. She's right here. Hi, Zuri. Yeah, Zuri. Zuri is, Zuri is uh, five years old, and um, she loves art, the color pink, and um, singing, and dancing, and everything. And um, yeah, I'm excited to have this conversation. Thank you all for having me today. Wait, before Ben passes the mic, you know I had to shout you out one time. My guy Penny just won an Emmy. If you want to tell him what you want an Emmy for, so we can give you a hand clap and give you your praises yeah. as well, man. Okay, okay, bring it back. Uh, so first of all, I know Joel from our, our time at Howard University. I love you. Uh, okay. Where I studied telecommunications, film, and all of that. And recently, I was awarded an Emmy Award for hosting a segment about mothers who lost their children to gun violence in Oakland. And the oh. Letters to my uh, letters to my child. I can uh, give more information to Joel to make sure that you all can see. Yes, sir. You gonna let me follow that man? <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah. My name is George Mills Jr. I am actually an employee here. I'm one of the managers here at Contra Costa College. Uh, I have two boys. Uh, my oldest son is 21, and my youngest is 14. Um, they are, they're everything to me. Uh, I remember telling people that uh, the way my father poured into me, I wanted to do that and more with my son, so I'm just excited to just be a part of this conversation today. So thank you all for having me. How you guys doing? Good. Pretty good. Oh, that sounds good. My name is uh, Charles Hankins, AKA Chris Rock. Everybody say hello to Chris Rock. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I grew up in Vallejo, California. Uh, I currently work here at uh, Contra Costa College. I am the police lieutenant, so I, I deal with everybody here. And I brought my two sons with me, CJ and Josh, and my wife for 15 years. Let's give it up for And uh, I think this is 
you guys. Please know what you guys got going on here. It's great information. I wish I was sitting down in one of these rooms when I was your age, uh, giving this information. Maybe I would be a little bit more advanced than where I'm at right now. Well, thank you for that. So I have a list of questions to kind of guide this conversation, but I also want to say if anyone in the audience has a question, feel free to stop me anytime. If you ask a question, you know what the deal is. You will get a prize or get an award of some kind. If it's a basic question, we got some ask for you. If it's a great question, we got some good stuff for you. So I'm just going to throw that out there. All right. And so the first question is, when and how did you know that you wanted to be a father? Well, I'll take that one. Uh, growing up, uh, first things first, I am from Liberia. Anybody know where that is? All right. So I, I am from Liberia. And uh, growing up, I come from a, rep, a, a rather large family. And we would take these trips. And my father would have us sing in the, in the Volkswagen bus as we are going. And that was one of the coolest things ever. Because we're just brothers, sisters, cousins, all in the buses and just hanging. And I'm like, I want to do this. You know, I want to be able to have my kids along with me. You know, and I swear to God, my dad used to play with his ring as he would tap the, the steering, it would make this sound. And I'm like, how was he making music tapping the, the steering? And, and I didn't realize that it was his ring that was making that noise. Um, and it was just the coolest thing to me, just having the family hang together. And for me, it was at that moment that I'm like, I, I want to be able to be a parent and do this with my kids. So that was my, that was it for me. Yes, sir. Anybody else want to answer that one? Uh, well, I got married when I was 25. So a little bit shortly after I got married, uh, I knew I wanted to build a family. But first, I wanted to you know build a bond with my wife and you know, make sure we had what we had going on strong, so we could produce uh, hopefully good kids. So shortly after I got married, we talked about it and. Uh, you know, I always, you know, had in my heart that I thought I'd be a dad, but I didn't know when I was going to be ready. And then once I got, you know, got married, I got a little bit more responsible. You know, got me a big job and started uh, having my business. That was a beautiful answer. Beautiful answer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one more person will take the question. Uh, I think my earliest memories of thinking about fatherhood is I had a homeboy. I have a homeboy from. Central Richmond, we both grew up without our fathers, and I remember being like three years old, four years old, real young, and like having these conversations. And uh, he had a child at 18, and I remember being in the parking lot at Alta Bates, and him saying, his son will never have to find you. And just that concept, my son will never have to find me. He'll have, always know where I am. And that stuck with me. And so when my daughter was born, that was always my thought, that I would, my daughter will always know where I am. And so um, the seed had been planted for a long time, but that, those are my, my earliest thoughts of the fatherhood. We do have a question. I see one. I see two. Let me get to. Oh, we got a lot of questions. Let me get to my man right here first. I saw his hand up. How did you know it's the right time to have a kid? I like that. That's a great question. Um, like I so said, we all probably have different stories. Um, like I so said, you always want to make sure you're stable, have a great job, great support. Uh, for my story, it's a little different. I thought I was ready. We were ready, me and my wife, but we weren't able to have a kid. Uh, so we did all the tests, we were healthy. Uh, so we went two, almost two, almost three years waiting and waiting and trying and trying. Uh, luckily, uh, my job uh, covered IVF, so we had to go that route. So I was ready and I've been ready, 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 and let, luckily it happened. Um, but you'll know when time is right for you, but I would say just always make sure you always have that support. Um, luckily, I have you know my girl, my mom, her mom. I just had a lot of support, and financially we were ready. Uh, so you just want to make sure you hit all those uh, check marks before you give it a shot. All right. That was a great question. I did see my fellows over here. My fellows over there. I will get to you. Um, but to continue, why don't you tell us the best thing about being a father and the most challenging thing about being a father? <laughs> best thing about being a father is. Watching her grow. Like, at the start of the pandemic, she couldn't turn the doorknob to exit out of her bedroom. Now she can read. Um, and just seeing that growth and constantly, like, when, as being a father, you're also a farmer. You are, like, constantly pouring into the seed that you're planting and watering it every day. So you've got to trim back a little bit. And then 
then you look up and it's blossoming. And so that um, is easily the best thing and also that's the hardest thing. Every day to be consistent, to be constantly great, uh, every single day. It makes me have to be on my P's and Q's in order to make sure that she's on her P's and Q's. I think I'm gonna go with the other question. What's most challenging? Yes, sir. Uh, for me, what's most challenging about being a parent is being able to pause so that your kid can feel and learn. That's an important thing. Um, growing up, I may have had the opposite of what my kids have, because um, my dad just, I wasn't a difficult kid, to put it, to put it mildly. Uh, but I'm sitting here watching my 21-year-old fail and not do what my dad did to, for me. Uh, because for me, it's important that he learns through the experience. Um, and so that is the most challenging thing, watching your kids fail and being willing and, and understanding to know that they're going to learn through that failure. That is very challenging for me in particular. Uh, and, that, and that's speaking from a 21-year-old who uh, woke up one morning and told me, college is not for me, I just want to sleep. For real, that's exactly what he told me. So wow. he's going to figure it out. Anybody want to shake? <laughs> All right. My guy here said he had a question. I would like, what would you feel like, like how was your reaction to find out kid? What was your reaction to find out that your uh, partner was pregnant? Um, I was excited. You know, I was, uh, I was at the house, and uh, my wife called me and says, hey, I'll tell you something. I'm pregnant, and that was exciting for me because we waited about five years before we had children, um, just because you, you know want to make sure that you're doing all you can um, for yourself before you bring someone else in the world. Make sure that you're you're actually ready. But to be honest, there's never a good time to be ready. You know, when they get there, you you understand that they're the most important thing in the world, and you kind of adapt your world around them. So. Um, for me, I was excited and elated that, you know, I'll have somebody hopefully that looks like me, talks like me, and acts like me. Yes, sir. Anybody else want to answer that one, or I got a lot of questions? Keep the questions. Here we go. You got something there. How do you fill the void of not having a father in your life? How do you fill the void of not having a father in your life? Or father figures, figure is what I would say. It's tough. All right, so uh, I want to know who I'm talking to. So how many people, that was a great in, question, how many people in the audience uh, are in touch or familiar with their fathers? Okay, yeah, I just wanted to get a sense of the people that I'm talking to. That's a, that's a, a solid, solid group. So personally, growing up without my father, it definitely left a lot of scars. And so that healing process is both through being present for my daughter and also me analyzing myself and like taking time for therapy, taking time to talk to my friends. I have a group of friends, all of us grew up in East Oakland, seven of us didn't have fathers in the household. So we would constantly go out and look up to OGs and kind of soak knowledge from them and kind of sub subconsciously reach out for the father figure. And through learning from the people in the community, I felt like that kind of, um, it allowed me to quilt together this concept of what manhood and fatherhood are. And so I, I, it's a daily process, but it's something that I, I, I both do through my personal life and through my interaction with my daughter. give one of the ladies a chance to ask a question as well, just because I know. If you're nervous, say one more time. How does it feel raising a black child in 2021? Um, actually, you know, I, I, I have maybe a, a different opinion. I, I feel um, honored. Um, because I get a chance to uh, mold an individual um, to not only what's going on in the world, but actually give back to the world. So, you know, with everything that's going on right now, you know, a bunch of divides, a, a bunch of uh, controversy, um, you try to raise a person in such a way to respect everybody. And uh, especially being a black male, uh, as a parent, just like my mom, I grew up as a, a, my mom was a single parent, you know, she feared me going out, out of the house every day. Not only violence, uh, if it was against, from police, uh, violence against 
you know, other, you know, joining the gang, the violence against, you know, how I was going to get treated. So I understand her fears, but I took those fears and I made sure that I was a responsible young man when I went out. I made her proud because I carried not only uh, my dad's name, but I carried her name too. So I was a representative of her everywhere I went. So if I can implore anything to you guys, is just realize that you guys are a representative to your mom, your dad, and everybody who, who's raised you. If it's your grandparents, if it's your auntie, your uncle, stepmom, whoever it is, you represent them and you hold their name. So make sure it's important to you because nobody else is going to treat you the way whoever loves you at home treats you. Uh, who hasn't won a prize yet? I just want to make sure we get to everybody. Uh, I'm going to end over there at Little Man, too. I saw you, man. Ooh. After you became a father, how did your identity change? That's a really, really good question. Think about that, man. I think for... So I've, I've always been... Um, an introspective person. You with me? I've always been an introspective person. So for me, the way that my identity ch uh, changed was um, I became more present for myself and more accepting of others. Um, and I say that to mean when you become a parent, you, so you, you, you tend to lose a bit of self in order to embrace the fact that you now have to consider others that you may not, may not have considered in your world. Uh, because I was a quiet kid for the most part, my world was literally my mom, my dad, my siblings. Um, but now, becoming a parent also meant that I needed to embrace an other person uh, that was both my seed and the, the, my wife uh, and everybody that comes along with the, Because it's not just when you have a parent, you and the child are, are part of it, obviously, but they have the grandparents, the great-grandparents, the pastor. So all those people uh, that you bring together become a part of your world. And embracing all of those people was something that I had to shift about my character. Uh, because, I, like I said, I, I just wanted my small little bubble to remain that way, and it couldn't be that we're becoming a father. So and letting the, being comfortable with the fact that other people have to come into my space was something that I had to change about myself. Have you ever had, I mean, have your parents ever struggled to provide for you? I can't answer that question, so I'm fast. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> true. Definitely have gone home with the lights cut off or the water cut off and feeling like, what, how can I make a difference, you know, and being 14, 15, not able to work? And it's frustrating, and it's humbling. And now as an adult, I feel like I was fortunate to grow up unfortunate. And now I understand the value of money and this conversation about wealth building and how it relates to fatherhood and being a provider and also self-esteem. And so, yeah, um, that was a part of my childhood experience and I'm trying my best to make sure it's not a part of my daughter's. I mean, the news, uh, when I was in college, I used to love watching the news. Uh, it got me kind of sick. It felt like I couldn't do nothing, couldn't make a change. Uh, but me raising Captain now, uh, long story short, my, my father was incarcerated. I was about four when he was driving down the street. Uh, fifth identity of somebody that just committed something, and then he was locked up 10 years. He was exonerated 10 years later, but you just never know. Uh, so I, it's best because when I was in school, I had a seminar that came uh, that taught us our, you know, our, our, um, our rights and stuff. What can we do, what not to do, and all that. Uh, so that was like one of my favorite classes here when I was actually here, all my criminal justice classes and whatnot. Uh, but you just want to make sure you inform them, their rights. Um, always want to humble them uh, in the experience uh, because you never know. Um, I mean, it's just the day we live in now, but like I said, I was a first-hand case when my dad 
left just because you just never know. Uh, but I'll be, I always tell my nephews and my cousins just to know your rights and just to educate them on that point so nothing like that can happen or they can't take advantage of them. So. How does it feel um, watching your children grow? Uh, exciting. Um, you get to see uh, the little changes um, that might not be big when you like see them every now and then, but when you watch them every day, you get to see just the little changes, the, the growth. And my little one, he, he actually plays the drums, and I'm always so proud of him. He plays the drums real good, and then every day I see him playing, and every day he just gets better and better. And you can see he's shy right there. He's putting his head down. He wants you guys to look at him. But uh, it's just those little things you cherish. And you'd be like, man. He, he thinks to myself, because of not having a desk, I'm, not, I'm kind of missed out on that. But now I can make sure that that person doesn't have to miss out on that. So sometimes, like you said down here, sometimes the unfortunate things that happen in your life is actually what makes you strong. Question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, what do you do if your kids' like dreams and like aspirations don't match with your dreams and like aspirations are for them? Question. I would pick that because I, I'm gonna stand up and answer that one because. Uh, so there's this thing that happens when people come from other parts of the world. Uh, somebody once said to me, as an African parent, how do you deal with it? Don't you want your son to be a doctor or a lawyer? And I remind people that I'm perhaps the most different African person you can think of, because my dad said, do what you can, do it well, no matter what it is. So my son telling me, I don't want to go to college, I just want to chill for a minute. I said to him exactly what my dad told me. Okay, if college isn't for you, that's okay. Find something. Do it damn well. That's real talk. That's just the bottom line. I again, it, I I had to sit with it for a moment, and I, and then I realized I need him to do something very well because what I the people who work here know this about me. I like to do something very well uh, because my father left me a legacy that I need to push forward. And that is part of what I'm trying to tell my son. Do something, do it well. Hello. What's the transition from like, you got a kid, you, you know, like, it's not just about you know what's like, what's the transition? You go from like, providing for yourself, and then you got like, whatever belongs to you, belongs to your child. Yeah, that's what I mean. It, it's happening. It's constantly happening. I think um, what helped me a lot is uh, my nephew is here as well. Hey, Reggie. Um, that that having a, a nephew I was close with and a niece I was close with as, as a young age helped me put in perspective my selflessness early on. But there's nothing like having a child where constantly you're constantly thinking about someone first. And it's not just about providing for them, but also how you take care of yourself. Like physically, I want to be around for when she's graduating college or whatever she decides to do. So really, selflessness isn't even just about making sure that she's provided for and taken care of and has shelter and all that, but also making sure I'm getting nutrients, vitamins, and proper exercise so that I live a long life and then I can constantly be around for her. I definitely had insecurities. Uh, that was one of the biggest things I struggled with. Early on question was like, how did uh, you feel when you first got that message? I was broke. I was living in my homeboy's house. I wasn't in a good position at all. And I was really down. And I had to think back to that first thing from my homeboy from a long time ago. Like, at the very least, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be present. Don't run off to Mexico. Whatever you do, don't go to Mexico. You know what I'm saying? But also, um, I had to overcome those insecurities, and it took some time. I'm, I would love to hear from other guys on the panel. Uh, yeah, definitely. You, you kind of had those things, especially in the back of your head. 
but just to be honest, there's, there's no playbook to this. There's no playbook to be the perfect father. So anybody looking for a playbook to be the perfect father, and they say they have it, it really is it's not out there. One, one thing that you, for me, what I did is I circled myself around people that I thought uh, exuded uh, good fatherhood and who, who were good men in the, in the neighborhood or who was good men at church or who was good men that I kind of knew from school or whatnot. And then I took bits and pieces from each of those men and, and I tried to apply it to my life. And what worked, what worked, what didn't work, didn't work. But every day I'm still learning to be a good dad. You know, every day I'm learning how to be patient, how to listen, how to uh, understand. Um, if you can understand people, if you study people, you'll be a good, a good parent. Because that's all it is, we're all people. So we all have different emotions, we all have different perspectives. But if you study how people think in general, you can be the best parent you can for your child. Because you, you have patience, you have kindness, you have wisdom. And knowing that you have to be vulnerable to your children. So like my son, sometimes I tell him, like, hey, I'm sorry dad messed up, I shouldn't have yelled, or I shouldn't have did this. Can you forgive me? Because that's the most important part is knowing that they, we do stuff wrong too, so they don't grow up thinking that their parents are perfect and see how they overcome their mistakes. So I know we have a lot more questions. Unfortunately, we won't get to them all. I have two more that I'm going to get to. We will get you some prizes, though. I know everyone's trying to get one, but uh, go ahead. What would I be if I didn't have a father? Where would you be? Where would I be if you didn't have a father? Um, Quite honestly, um, I've, I've been driven all my life, so I, I'm not sure how to respond to that question. I know that I've always wanted... So, I want to be a lawyer, right? Um, my dad was always a college administrator growing up, and I didn't want to, to be in that business. Uh, then I got into law school, and I hated it. I lasted one week. It happened. And my advisor told me, well, you can do something else that's more meaningful than being a lawyer in Haiti. So I stopped that after my first week in law school and I'm like, okay, I can do something else. So I went and got my degree in policy. Policy can impact a lot more people than being a lawyer and finding individual people to help along the way. So, um, so what would I be? I, where would I be? I think I would be in the exact spot I am right now because drive has always been a part of who I am. I'll take, I'll take the other route. Like I, I'm happy that I grew up without my father, actually. He wasn't been, wouldn't have been the best influence in my life. Understanding who he is and what he was into, if that would have been in my household, I wouldn't have been an Emmy Award winning journalist, I don't believe. Situation where it's about racial unequal? Unequal. Uh, well, I'm a black and Mexican. Uh, growing up in Richmond, I felt like I was a double edged sword. Um, but I hope you guys can answer this. I want to know. I can answer that. I can tell you. I mean, like, when have I not felt like there was. Some racial, racial bias, right? I think one of the biggest things to me is that for high school, I went to high school out in Danville. Show of hands if you know where Danville is. We just left there, okay? <laughs> Glad y'all made it down fine and everything. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Oakland, went to school out in Danville, and it is very white and very wealthy out there. And not only did I not feel racially equal, but I also didn't feel like I was on an equal class level financially. And that really uh, messed with my thinking and my self confidence as a high schooler. And that's something I had to fight to overcome. And, Luckily, Howard University was there to kind of steer me on the right path to rec make me recognize how beautiful I am to be black. Amen. All right, so we're going to get to our last session, but I quick give out a hand next to our legend little man ask a question. What is your favorite thing to do with your son? What is your favorite thing to do with your child? Oh, man. Oh, yeah, I gave you something. What do you got? What do you got? What uh, my my favorite thing to do with my kids is actually just talk. Um, 
I want to know, I just want to talk to them about whatever. If that topic doesn't matter, just to sit down for a moment, hey, what's up with you? What's going on? I saw you doing this today, what's that about? Just to talk, or even have them talk to you. There's nothing like a conversation with your kids. So to me, my favorite thing is talking to my kids. And anybody can? Well, my favorite thing to do is go shopping. We don't even have to buy nothing, but actually going down each aisle, looking at the toys. I remember me as a kid, I used to always want to get stuff from Toys R Us. I mean, Toys R Us. <laughs> so I always want to get stuff from Toys R Us. And uh, so me and my CJ, we go we go to Walmart, we go to Target or whatnot, we just look at the aisle, we, we do like that. I was like, yeah, that's tight, man. You know, so that's my favorite thing to do with my, uh, with my oldest and my youngest is uh, play the drums with him. So those are my two favorite things to do. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, I'm a storyteller. I love storytelling. It's so a story time, bedtime. We go to the library every, every, every other week. Every Monday we go to the library. We get seven books. We read a book every night. And then after that we do five things that we did today. And she re recounts her day. And so she tells a story to me as well. And so I, I love exchanging stories, talking to her. I wanted to steal that with old punk kids. And uh, for my son, I'm be at two months. There's not much I can do right now. But the funnest thing, every morning, me and my wife, uh, we, we pull up all the curtains, and we sing him a little good morning thing, and he just lights up. We just show him outside, the grass, everything, the trees. It just it brings up my day. It's just pretty fun. I can't wait. Uh, hearing all these amazing stories for them, so only two months down the road for me, I can't wait to see the next 10 years. You gonna sing that song? Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> all right, let's give it up for the panel, everybody. So thank you for coming. I know you guys are getting hungry. We have one more thing. Hopefully, George, we could uh, make it quick, but while George is setting up for his uh, college door mindset, I want to bring John Lee back on so we can introduce Chef, you prepare the food today. So the great thing is to have all of you here today and hear people in every part of the industry. We got people here who've done everything that you can do, and they all look like you. And then I want to bring Chef Wynn up here. Chef Wynn is a chef to the hundred. And the hundred, I want to say 90 to 95% of them brothers is millionaires. And this brother prepares our meals. Uh, anytime we've ever called on Chef Win, he makes it work. Whatever our budget is, he makes it work. And that's a testament to him because he has his own business. Like a lot of you want to be entrepreneurs, right? You want to have your own business, be your own self-made men and women. He does that and he gives back to the community. So I want to give us a round of applause to Chef Win, who prepared your meal you will take with you when you leave here. Chef Win, can you come up please? And if you're interested in this industry, is he, he, and, and I love chefs because look how they dress. They look so, you know, like the master chefs, right? Executive chef can win. And, and I'm serious about this. He's the kind of brother. If you're interested in this industry, you reach out to him, and I'm sure he will give you some nuggets. If not, get an avenue for you to get into what he does. So, chef, we appreciate you so much, brother, and thank you again. All right, everybody good? I'm waiting for the grub because I'm hungry. You know when uh, Mr. Gunther was up here talking, he, he, uh, he played the Tupac song, and I don't know if everybody was listening at the time. And my, my phone's dying so I can't play the song that I want to play because I'm a, I like music too. Um, But there's a song called DNA, and the first line says, I've got royalty, I've got loyalty inside my DNA. How many of you believe you got royalty in your DNA today? And I say that because every time I've done this presentation, and I've done it in the last three years, that is We've been hosting this. I like to remind all of you in here that regardless of your station now, regardless of where you are now, 
You come from people who are royalty. It might not look like it now, it might not feel like it now, but you better believe that you come from a legacy of royalty. So that it, I just want to remind all of us of, of that before we, we get started. Uh, my job today is to talk to you about, let me, let me see if I can put this up real quick. I just want to just leave that screen up. Anybody know who that, who that is? That is Mr. W.E.D. Dubois. Du Bois, they call him. Uh, and uh, there you go. Du Bois is one of my, my heroes because he reminds me of what excellence looks like. Uh, and then I, I tell people all the time, because I am not American, I, I already grew up with everybody that around me looks like me, right? So I know I don't have that perspective. But I also know that, that growing up in Liberia, one of the things it did for me was it, it, it allowed me to believe that I'm not inferior to anybody, right? Nobody told me that I can't do something because of the way I look. Nobody told me that I did not have abilities. Everybody around me told me, you're about to do this. When it comes to going to college, are y'all with me? All right, stay with me. I'm just, we're going to get through this. When it comes to going to college, that's the mindset that you need to have. You can do this. And you can especially do this because there are tons of people in this room, at home, in your community who are looking out for you. How many of you are concerned about going to college? Like concerned? All right? Julie, you have. You got the mic? Do right there. You don't want to? Okay, I, I just want to tell you what your concerns are. Just anybody. Take one, yeah. Money. Thank you for that. In the back there. Finding a major you like. All right, so let, let me just take those two real quick. Money. Everybody thinks about college and how you pay for college and all that stuff. So I came to the U.S. as an international student, right? Tuition was something that I needed to worry about because for international students, your tuition is almost triple what everybody else would pay. Back in the day, uh, when I started college, you paid $8 per unit. Everybody paid $8, I was paying $198 per unit. So my tuition was literally about three, four grand a semester. But you know, for, I was fortunate I came to the US with a little bit of money so I could afford to pay my tuition. But going towards the end, I applied for my first scholarship. I need you to listen to this real quick. My first scholarship that I got in America was American Women in Education. Anybody caught that? What I said? This was a scholarship designed for women in electrical engineering. First, I'm not a woman, but I wanted the money. So I applied, and as it turns out, nobody had applied for that scholarship in five years. The money's just sitting. So I applied, I got the money, and yay, it helped me to get my engineering degree. So we thank them, we thank them every single time that we can. Amen. So when it comes to money, 
You apply and let someone tell you no. Yes. Don't ever say, I don't qualify. That is the worst thing you can possibly say to yourself, I don't qualify. So apply, let them tell you no. Finding a major. College is about experiences. Right? If you like playing video games, I guarantee you can find a major that will allow you to do video games and do it well. He talked about the different kinds of stock. He talked about CPUs and GPUs. NVIDIA. NVIDIA. People who in NVIDIA probably got majors that allowed them to keep messing around with computers and video games and graphics and all those different things. So finding a major is just being sure that you do something that you're absolutely sure you're going to love doing. So, again, when it comes to finding a major, that's something that you want to think about. But I do want to talk to us quickly about one of the things that I like to share with students when it comes to college. First of all, for black and brown people, there's one story they have for us when it comes to college. That story is, we can, we're not going to do it or we're not going to do it well. Du Bois changes that narrative entirely. You in here, you're changing that narrative also. Because you're, you're setting up yourself so that you can be scholars, you can be entrepreneurs, you can be inventors, you can be whatever you choose to be. And so, the single story for black and brown people that we're unsuccessful, that we're lazy, that we're... Uh, all these different things that they have to say about us, you represent the shifting of that narrative so that people can recognize that we are indeed scholars, we are indeed inventors, we are indeed entrepreneurs, we are all of those things that the stereotype says we can't be. We might not be up in the forefront, like you said, they were looking for more people to be in the banking, the, the, the banking investment industry, come up to the forefront because there are lots of us who have these gifts. We might be sitting on it, or we might be looking for the right opportunities to step out into the light. So, uh, I want to encourage all of you to never pay attention to that single story that you can't do what you need to do. The other thing is, everybody here has a hobby. Everybody here has a hobby. One of the things that we do not do is to collect all our hobbies, all the things we like, all the things that we're good at, and try to take an inventory of your assets, because that's what they are. If you like playing video game, that's your asset. If you like talking, that's your asset. My dad had so many friends. His number one asset was people. I don't know if it's the same like in most, most of your, your communities, but I have so many uncles and aunties growing up come to realize 89, almost 90% of them were not relatives of mine. My dad just collected so many people. They just show up at the house, look, and I'm like, hey uncle, hey auntie, how you doing? And it took me forever because I'm like, wait, remember I said my bubble was small. And so, as a shy kid, the only people that I talked to were those people and they brought their children around and I'm going, okay, well, I can't date her because that's my cousin. But no, that ain't my cousin. So, you know, so you're messing ahead a little bit. But when you start to think about how you collect your assets, how you find your, you know, your partner in life, how you find your, your favorite teacher, it's all about making sure that you can say, I have chronicled all the things that I need in my life. So whether it's the people that you collect, whether it's the, the hobbies that you have, it's important to take account of your assets right now. If you like singing, how many people think that they can make singing a career? Right? Singing. If, you're, if you like singing, and one of your play cousins knows somebody, how, how can you transition from my singing to connecting with my cousin who knows this person to get into the right place. 
That's what college can do for you. Your professors, the people that you walk around across campus, they have assets that you can tap into. So that speaks to the next thing, connection. College is about connection. I have um, my college advisor, and for the last 20 years, 20 years, we have coffee once a week. 20 years. And that's important because the relationship that he and I have built over the years allows us to be able to talk about things that we may not have been thinking about uh, in a past conversation or something that I might not have been thinking about, uh, but that we can both put on the table and just talk through. When you come to college, uh, there are some people who be their future wives in college, their future bosses in college. Uh, you know, you go to your professor's director recommendations for scholarships. So it's important that you make those connections. Because when, you, when we talk about the college going mindset, uh, if you don't have the right people around you, sometimes it can be difficult. And so we want to get, open you to the possibility of allowing other people to come into your space. Uh, sometimes it might be invasive, sometimes they might be uh, over the top, but it's important that you open up yourself to the possibility of other people coming into your space. One of the, the things I told my son, uh, you know, when my son graduated high school, I sent them with a school in, North, in, in South Carolina. And like I told you right now, he said he doesn't want to do school. And he lasted five days and came back to California and was like, no, it's not for me. And I'm like, okay, if you're not going to do the HBCU, come back to California, uh, you, well, the actor just showed up. Uh, and I'm like, okay, that's not, that's not okay. He's five days, I'm like, how do you get back? Oh, mom bought me a ticket. But, it, I mean, I tell people all the time, college is about experiences. When you go to college and developing, when I talk about developing a college going mindset, I want you to be prepared for new experiences. Ones that you find, one that you create, and one that you walk into. Many of you here um, may not have traveled yet. Many of you here, uh, if, you, if you're not a reader, get into reading. Uh, you can travel just through a book. Um, if the author's been different places and they write about those places, you get the experience of where they've been. So the college learning mindset is about exploring or allowing yourself to explore new opportunities, new experiences. Uh, because you're never going to be able to, uh, to do something if you, if, you, if you don't open up yourself to that possibility. And then the last thing I want to talk to us about is being purposeful, having a vision, and having a mission. What do I mean when I say be purposeful? All of us in here, and I'm going to say it this way, black people, we got swagger. When you walk into a room, people know you walk into the room. Because you walk in there with your chest up. My man, right there. What, what's your shirt say? What does your sweater say? What does it say in your sweater? It says drip. We got a lot of drip in us. So we walk around dripping all day. All day we dripping. So be purposeful when you get to college. Walk into your college experience knowing that you own that space, right? Have a vision. Again, you can either have it before you get there or look for it while you're on a college campus. Be clear about where you want to go, right? If you want to be an athlete, an athlete, Go to college with the mindset, look, I'm going to be the best baller on this team, right? If you're going to be a scholar, I'm going to be the best scholar. But have a vision. And then have a mission. How are you going to get there? I think it's important that once you build your purpose, 
your vision and your mission, college will not be something that is uh, practical for you. It becomes something that you can experience and enjoy because it's important as people of color, as black and brown people in particular, that our college going experience is one that we, we embrace, one that we enjoy, and one that we, we, uh, we allow other people to support us through. So for me and myself, for Joel, for uh, the coach back there, for my man uh, Delano, you know, you don't get a lot of people named Delano, first of all, so we, we had a laugh about that. He's like, I like the president. I'm like, uh, friend and He's like, yeah. So Delano over there, we are all part of your college experience. One of the things that I really want you to walk away from here today is, if anybody asks you, do you have a connection at CCC, what you gonna say? You cannot have walked away from here and not say, I don't have a connection to CCC. And here's the other thing, the last thing, because I know we're short on time. We're not just resources for your education at CCC. We've been through this. He went to Howard University. I went to Cal State East Bay and San Francisco State. Uh, well, it was called Hayward back in the day. Uh, I went to Hayward in San Francisco. Now I'm doing my doctorate at California Baptist University. So we've been around, right? So we have assets. We have resources that we can help you all with. So you may not have questions today, but talk to the, to the folks who brought you here today. Hey, I have a question. Can Mr. Mills, Mr. Shanks, Mr. Wade, can any one of those folks help us out because we have resources that we want to pour into you because we were blessed and we want to make sure that we bless you in the same way. So we thank you for your time. I'm going to let you all come and wrap up the show. All right, let's give it up one more time for everybody who presented today. I want to also give yourselves a round of applause for the interview that you guys brought here. I really appreciate that on the questions and everything that you guys had. I got one more thing to give away before you guys get up out of here. This Kindle Fire. But before we do this, I need everybody, can you stand up for me one time, please? Can you stand up for me one time? We just like to document things like this. We love to do things for our black students just in general, so I had to get a picture before everyone leaves. On the count of three, let me get you guys to say African American Symposium. One, two, three. All right, for my guy that's driven, I got the drip on right here. If he can answer this one question, because I owe them something. All the pressure on you. What? You don't even know. He's like, what's going on? All right, so Joe Frank had a quote in the message in his first presentation. 